Hi everyone. Thanks. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, yeah. Hi. I'm uh, Scott. I'm a uh, cloud engineer at G Research. Um, this picture here of me at the uh, at Dan Alice at the LHC at an OpenStack days a couple of years ago. Uh, so yeah, I'm an OpenStack engineer, uh, cloud engineer at GR. I mainly focus on deploying OpenStack and uh, Ironic. And I'm Ross Martin. I've been at GR for a similar amount of time, about four years, working as a cloud engineer. And I mostly focus on OpenStack and, and Ceph. So I imagine quite a lot of you probably haven't heard of us. Uh, so we're G Research. Um, we're Europe's leading quantitative research company. We're mostly based in London, in the West End, but we're actually expanding into the US this year, into Dallas. So it's really exciting for us. And what do we do? So we create software to analyze and manage large data sets. We look to identify patterns in that data using some of the latest machine learning techniques, and we try and predict future movements in financial markets around the world. So a little bit about um, Open Infra at G Research. So historically, GR was a bit of a window shop. Uh, we're currently going through a kind of digital transformation period over multi years. Um, and then there's a big shift towards using a lot more open source technology. So it's things like OpenStack, Linux, Kubernetes, that kind of thing. Um, and to deploy our OpenStack cloud, we use Colo, Ansible, and Kyobi. So for those of you in the room that don't know what that is, Colo allows you to build OpenStack services in uh, Docker containers. Colo, Ansible allows you to orchestrate that and deploy it across your infrastructure. And then Kyobi uh, allows you to sort of do that on bare metal nodes. And it also helps with other things like generating the configuration, setting up the network, installing Docker, PIP, all those kind of things. Uh, and then we also have Ceph, um, which backs our OpenStack Cloud, and we use Ceph Ansible for that. So we're currently on the OpenStack train release. Um, we've had a few issues getting off of Center 7, um, but now we're kind of coming off over the, over the sort of um, horizon of that. And we're moving over to Center 8, and then we're going to quite aggressively upgrade, hopefully. So yeah, hopefully when we get to Vancouver, there might be a bit of a happier story to tell there. Um, so Ceph is currently on Nautilus, and this was upgraded last year from uh, Luminous. So with our open infra, we try to keep um, as close as we can to the upstream st uh, stable branches. We contribute back a lot of the stuff that we do, um, and we currently have around 67 commits merged into um, OpenStack projects. Uh, we also like getting involved with the community, so we do things like we um, go to RRC meetings uh, for Collar, we uh, get involved with PTG, and we ha actually have a development team within GR who are specifically just for doing um, open, uh, like open source contributions on behalf of the company. Um, yeah, and we're also, we're also members of the foundation here and uh, the CNCF as well. So I'll just talk about a few of the challenge we challenges that we have at GR. Um, as with every cloud, they come with challenges. So uh, these are the kind of four headings we think of them as. In terms of flexibility, we've got lots of different teams and loads of diverse use cases and lots of different types of hardware to support that. And while some teams might just require a generic virtual machine to do some dev work, others might require like specialized equipment, you know, accelerators, things like that, for more specific like deep learning, as Scott mentioned. So we need to be able to run a heterogeneous cloud that can support all of this and more. And further to that, we need to be able to pivot quickly when something new comes along. So when there's a, a new hardware accelerator or a new networking technology or something like that, we need to be able to take advantage of that quickly. So efficiency, we've been a research company. We've got a fairly significant estate. And in order to make the most of this, we need to assure that we're efficient in everything we do. It's not good enough for us to leave spare compute on the table that one or two percent really multiplies up at scale. So not only with our compute, we also need to be efficient with our deployment and support processes. We need to make sure that the number of engineers that we need to manage the estate is as small as possible, but that we can still stay on top of the maintenance and make changes quickly. And whilst we need to be efficient, we also need the performance from the estate. So um, we need to push the boundaries of performance to give us an edge against our competition. And the quicker we can complete some research, get it to market, the quicker we can start some more. And finally, probably the biggest, one of the biggest things for us is security. We need to be sure that our platforms will conform to the latest security standards and maintain like a high level of confidence in the integrity of the estate. One of the ways that we're looking to achieve this is via like a monthly rebuild cadence in which we aim to kind of rebuild every server uh, every, every month. 
Um, and obviously that means we rely really heavily on automation. But if we get it right, then the estate will always be clean, patched, and, and reproducible. So by, uh, by, securing, by doing that and securing our deployment pipelines and removing humans, kind of using our infrastructure as code, um, and you know, peer review and Jenkins automation to deploy that, we can ensure a high level of security across the platform. So whilst it's quite straightforward to deploy OpenStack for traditional virtual machines, it becomes quite a lot more complicated when you take into account some of the challenges that we have and the ability to schedule instances that have different hardware requirements and different software requirements on top can be quite overwhelming. So just to dig into a couple of our use cases, um, this is the first one. Um, so our general compute platform uh, traditionally uh, consists of uh, CPU and memory dense servers to provide sort of just generic machines, uh, pretty vanilla. Um, so uh, they have access to a little bit of local SSD, um, large all flash Ceph cluster that's presented um, to, the, to the users via Cinder, and then that gives them access to um, RDB and uh, Redis Gateway. So um, our platform team, one of our platform teams in GR uh, was uh, set the task to provide our researchers with a secure environment to let them test and develop the models that they, they um, build uh, before they're submitted onto our much larger compute farm. Uh, to make this possible, um, what they wanted to do is kind of build a, like a hardened Linux virtual machine uh, for, the, for the user to have, uh, which had direct access to a GPU. So when we say GPUs, we're not talking about um, like cheap eBay uh, GPUs. They're proprietary, like they're... Um, yeah, like A100s, V100s, that kind of thing. Um, and they're specifically designed for uh, like machine learning, deep learning. Um, and these can be really, really dense. We get like eight in a six U chassis. Uh, so when we were sort of present, when the team approached us with this and we were presented with the task, um, we had two options uh, to present a GPU into a virtual machine. So the first is a vGPU. So this allows an administrator to split kind of multiple workloads across a GPU, essentially sharing like a portion um, of the GPU rather than the whole thing. You do have the option to pass the whole thing, but there is a limitation in Nova, um, which, would, uh, which would mean that you can only pass a single GPU or vGPU through to the, to the guest. You wouldn't be able to do two, three, four, or up to eight. Um, in that case, you'd have to have eight se separate instances. Um, so this can be really useful in, in terms of like VDI use cases and things, but for us, that's not really our primary focus. So going on to the second option, that would be to present the whole GPU um, up to the server using uh, PCI pass-through. So this method means that the guest has full control over the device and its memory, and it should be able to use 100% of its performance. Um, and you know, HPC is obviously really important. So we decided to go, uh, well, no surprise, we decided to go um, with passing through the uh, entire GPU rather than a portion. But for us, basically, the, the extra configuration and the extra virtualization, uh, virtualization layer didn't really provide any benefit. Um, uh, yeah, and as I said, our, our users kind of, they, will, they can use more than one GPU rather than one. Um, so yeah, that kind of flexibility is uh, really good. But obviously, this is just in terms of our use case, so um, uh, yeah. Obviously, evaluate your options. So, yeah, the second option, well, well the second task we were challenged with, um, we had a team approached us and they needed NVMe attached storage uh, to provide raw NVMe's into the into the guest um, to do things like databases, caching servers. So, our users wanted to maintain their uh, usual flow of work, uh, so using OpenStack and Terraform um, to deploy their, their machines. Um, but they needed the ascent, they needed the additional hardware, and as the and on the side of the OpenStack team, um, we wanted to make sure that we reused the lessons learned when we did the vGPUs and GPU stuff. So, there were, uh, PCI pass through was actually the only option for NVMe's. We didn't have like a like a virtual NVMe option. Um, but what we had kind of set up uh, when we did uh, the GPUs, the pass through, we kind of had this in mind that this is going to this is going to change in the future, and there's going to be other pieces of hardware. So we kind of set the foundations there that allowed us to do this part um, using very little engineering effort, really. And to do this, we used a, um, a Nova feature uh, and placement called Traits. Uh, so we're going a little bit more into detail of what Traits are and how they are applied to hypervisors and, uh, a little bit later. But first of all, we'll just quickly take you through um, some of the GPU pass-through stuff. 
Yeah, so a uh, quick couple of examples for PCI pass-through um, is super easy to configure, um, but it's useful to just see. So uh, the most important thing is you need the vendor and the product ID for the device, so we can look that up quickly with LSPCI. Um, once we have that, we just need to do a bit of configuration for the controller, so Nova API needs to understand what that device is, so we give it an alias. Um, so yeah, vendor ID, product ID, and then a friendly name. And we also need to enable uh, the filter scheduler for PC, PCI pass-through. Additionally, for every compute node, you also need to add this bit of config, which is essentially the same alias, but also a pass-through whitelist. Um, and the whitelist basically just allows uh, Nova to access that device. So in order to be able to pass through the device, we also need to do a little bit of host configuration um, um, by modifying some grub options. So we need to, so we need to uh, use, uh, we need to essentially blacklist the device with the, the Nouveau driver uh, to stop the OS picking it up when it boots. And we also enable IOMMU, um, which gives better performance from moving memory between the GPU and the, and the host. Um, so once you've done that, you can update grub, give the box a reboot, um, and that will apply the changes. So once you have that, um, we obviously need a flavor. So you can just create a basic flavor, but it, it does need a property, and the property, as you see here, is PCI pass-through, and again, that alias, so it knows what it's referencing. And then we also configure the number of devices we want to pass through. So in this case, we're essentially passing through the whole, all eight GPUs in that box. So now we have a flavor and OpenStack is configured. How does the scheduling actually work? So in its most basic form, OpenStack scheduling uses flavors, filters, and weighers. And flavors have CPU, RAM, and disk requirements and can contain that additional metadata as seen. The scheduler will request a list of resource providers from placement, compute nodes as we know them, and it will filter them down then based on the requirements of the flavor. And there's lots of different filters you can enable, um, like compute filter, availability zone filter, image properties, like there's a, a massive list. Uh, and once we have that list of hosts that are suitable for this instance, um, they get put through a weighing algorithm. So this is straight from the docs, but as you can see, um, the weighers are used to sort the remaining hosts into an order of precedence, and they, they're configurable. You can configure the multipliers, um, and we can tweak those to affect the outcome that we're after. So an, a, a clear example of this is uh, using them to prefer certain hosts over others, um, which is like stacking or spreading. So in this case, the algorithm will compute the weight of the host based on the remaining PCI devices, and it'll then sort them, and the host with the largest weight will get the VM, which will be the one with the most free devices. So essentially, we'll be just spreading them out across the estate, uh, yeah, distributing evenly. And if it's configured with a negative value, we'll get the opposite, so it'll actually stack them up. Um, and we choose to stack them up mostly, but not completely. Um, and the main reason for that for us is that the less number of hosts that are in play means we can essentially rebuild the estate uh, quicker and easier. We don't have to move so, ma so many things around. Um, yeah, and that helps with our monthly rebuild strategy. Uh, so yeah, the next part is uh, traits. <laughs> so uh, placement, or as it was previously called Nova placement, gives us the ability to schedule workloads with a lot more granularity. Um, and to identify what kind of workload can um, be scheduled on um, what kind of uh, hypervisor. And when you do that, as I said, using traits. So if you think of a resource provider, essentially in Nova, that's, that's just a hypervisor. And traits can be, um, if you think of traits as kind of a form of metadata, um, and then uh, you can add that to a resource provider or a hypervisor. Um, and then they can represent certain qualities that the hypervisor has. So for example, if you wanted to record and offer like a percentage of your hypervisors within your cloud, um, this would be really easy to do using traits. All you'd, have to, all you'd essentially have to do is just mark all of your production nodes um, with, a, with a production trait. Uh, so let's go for an example of just how this works. So here we've got three compute nodes. Um, and as you can see um, in the list, uh, there's no real, real way to determine what kind of qualities each hypervisor has. They all kind of look the same. So if we do, uh, if we look here, we've got the default traits that are applied to the hypervisor by Nova. So these are, are standard by the placement service. So to add a, um, a custom trait to uh, your hypervisor, we use an OpenStack command called, uh, well, OpenStack resource provider trait set. And then uh, all custom traits have to start with custom underscore. 
So when setting the traits, you've got to specify them all um, in one list for the resource provider. Um, and you do this by um, providing dash dash trait uh, multiple times. Um, it doesn't currently support a way to like append or remove. So just make sure you add them all at the, um, at the same time. Um, you don't need to worry um, about um, overwriting the original ones that were there. If you when you actually do this, if, you, if you're quick enough or you're watching the command, you'll see that the default ones will kind of disappear, but within a kind of second, they'll come back. Um, and then, yeah, so in this example, um, I've added uh, two traits, custom foo and custom bar. So finally, what we do now is we just add the flavor property to make the link between what the user asked for and where it can be placed within the cloud. Uh, so yeah, we've got um, custom foo in there as required. And then, yeah, it's also worth noting that if you do this with a PCI device, you need to make sure that you set yeah, the property for both the trait and the PCI alias. Just because you're using traits doesn't mean you can just forget about the PCI alias. Uh, so yeah, the, the thing that this gives us is real kind of flexibility when we're logically separating the cloud. Um, yeah, um, and it's, it's really in, inexpensive to add these traits. There's no, there's no configuration to actually push out to the cloud. There's no restart of Nova or anything like that. It's just, you just apply it using the CLI. So yeah, to achieve this at scale um, and avoid like human error um, and operational toil, it, it makes sense to kind of wrap this up in an Ansible playbook or some kind of automation script. Uh, an interesting feature that we make quite extensive use of in Kyobi is the ability to run something called custom playbooks. And this provides a sort of scalable way to apply and maintain our traits for our hypervisors uh, without having the, use, the, the need for a, like a, an admin to log in and do, something, do things manually. So what we do is we just wrap up the commands that an operator would run in an Ansible playbook and this gives us a repeatable way to ensuring the correct traits are applied to each hypervisor. And this can be controlled by using built-in functions in Ansible, like group files and uh, host files. So we could do a next step of this. It's a pretty basic implementation. Um, all we do is just run the OpenStack commands. Uh, and to be fair, that just gives us what we need. Um, you can return the results in the OpenStack CLI in JSON, and that's really easy to kind of do what you need to with Ansible. Uh, so as a next step, we could kind of wrap this up in an Ansible module, but for the sake of what we've done at the moment and the presentation, this is just a small example of, um, yeah, uh, of how you can do it really quickly with little effort. So yeah, if we look back to uh, what Ross was saying at the beginning, um, what we actually had, like, uh, set out to achieve, like how do, we, how do we kind of do this? So the flexibility side, uh, traits gives us a really flexible way to logically separate our hypervisors within the cloud. Uh, so when new, new use cases come along, um, we, have a we have the foundations in place to get ideas to market in a reasonable amount of time. So the efficiency, by having full control over um, where things are scheduled in combination with things like uh, the stacking, uh, we ensure that we make the, the most out of the, the pool of our hardware. And then, yeah, performance. So as we pass through the entire device to the guest, um, there's, there's no extra additional virtualization layers that we don't need. Although the impact isn't probably too much um, by using the vGPU, but if there's no real benefit to having the virtualization layer, you could argue just why bother in the first place. And then security. Um, so yeah, we use Kyobi uh, and Color Ansible as a secure method, along with Jenkins um, and yeah, infrastructure's code, all that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, it allows us to do follow the, the GitOps sort of workflow and make sure that people aren't doing things manually. So looking forwards, um, there's a few things we still need to think about, things we haven't solved yet. Um, we, we don't think they're solved yet, but if you believe they are, please come and tell us. We'll be uh, pleased to know. Um, and the first thing is uh, being able to clean these devices. So um, when we pass through GPUs, obviously the memory gets used. And when we give raw NVMe devices through, people write data to them. And we need to, c currently, we have to silo some of those um, machines to different groups to reduce the risk of data contamination. Um, and that's not very efficient. So we need to find a way to ensure that they're clean so the next user that picks them up you know, has a clean environment, and that would just give us more, more flexibility in our estate. Um, and the problem then is how do we allocate them fairly, because it's pretty much a first come, first serve, as long as you have a quota and a flavor access. Um, so the, some good news on this that I've learned in the last couple of days is that a concept called unified limits, which I think John Garbutt from Stack HPC came up with, um, will hopefully help with this. So that's something we'll be looking at soon. Um, I think it has just been merged. And then lastly, uh, in order to get the best performance out of the GPUs, 
It helps to link the, the vCPU processes and the GPUs to the same socket. And we have Numa Awareness enabled, but I believe there's, the VM currently only pr provides a single PCI route, which means we can't tell which socket the, uh, the GPU is connected to. Um, so, yeah, if we can solve that, that hopefully will get us a little bit more performance as well. So that's pretty much what we have for you today. So thanks for listening. Um, if you see us around, come and have a chat anytime. Um, and yeah, if there's any questions, we'd like to open the floor. Yep. Okay. Do you want to use the microphone? Is that okay? Thanks. Okay, so um, cleaning is an interesting topic. I will probably head out to you afterward because we were... Oh, did that not work? Sorry, I think... it's a little bit quiet. Yeah. Okay, let me try this. So cleaning is an interesting topic and uh, we should probably talk about this afterward. The other thing is um, we found that Nova is not consistent in which devices, a PCI device it passes through to a VM. For instance, uh, not, I'm not sure if it affects also soft reboots, but uh, I think at least during hard reboots or during hypervisor reboots, VMs may end up with different NVMe devices, which has caused a lot of confusion with our customers, really, okay. because they suddenly saw the data or didn't see it anymore because they got a clean device instead of the one they had. Do you have anything in that regard on your infrastructure? Have you seen that or have you found a solution or is that something not on your radar or? So as far as I'm aware, that's not on our radar. I don't think we've seen that, um, but obviously that's an interesting issue <laughs> that we should look at. What, do, you know what, if that, is that, do you know what version you've seen that in? Uh, I think we've been seeing that also on train, but certainly okay. on Pike. Okay, well, uh, we'll definitely have a look at that because yeah, okay. <laughs> that's an issue. Thank you. Thank you. So I was, hi, I was going to wait and talk to you guys about this afterwards, but since this also came up in the previous question, have you considered using a remote disaggregated NVMe storage service instead of passing through direct access to the NVMe devices? There are solutions today that have Cinder support and will give you local NVMe performance. Okay, that's interesting to know. I think. And by the way, they also solved the problem that the previous uh, question was about. Okay, that's definitely something for us to look at. Um, we, we know that our particular use case needs like raw access to the disk, like it's a raw device. So I don't know whether or not your solution would cater for that. Um, but it just works quite well with passing through the device directly. Um, but yeah, maybe we'll just have a chat and see what options there are. Cool, thank you. Thanks. Is there anything else? Okay, thanks. Thanks very much.